Hey guys, it's <clears throat> uh, Rev Morrow. Um, hope you've all had a good first week back in these crazy times. Um, we're gonna start uh, doing Lonely Men of Faith in uh, a minute, but before I do that, I wanted to make a note of something I've been thinking about, which is that Savior Yechezkel starts by he bishloshim shana bravi b'chamisha v'chodesh on the thirtieth year and the fifth day of the fourth month v'ani b'toch hagola when I was amongst the exile was in the exile on the har kavar on the kavar river niftachu hashemayim ve'ere marot elohim the heavens opened and I saw visions of God there's like a strong debate going back to Tanakh but throughout Rishonim about the relationship between the land of Israel and prophecy, but Savior Cheskel ties the two together. That actually being outside the land of Israel is deeply connected to his experience of God. Savior Cheskel is a very powerful book of Nebuah, marked by some of the most powerful images of God and experiences of God that any prophet expresses or wrote down, and that's. Dafka because he's not in the normal structured place where people are used to experiencing God and used to having prophecy. The, the unusual nature of his prophecy is tied together with his intensity. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, with that, I want to go back to our regularly scheduled programming of um, of Soloveitchik, where uh, Obviously, I'm not going to do this every week, but I'll try get, I'm going to want to get through the rest of the classes that I have planned, which is uh, going to do about three classes on the Lily Man of Faith, a few on Tefillah, which will also focus pretty heavily on some texts from the Lily Man of Faith, and then uh, one or two classes on Kol Dodi de Fake, which will round out the year for us. Uh, though it is supposed to be timed, so it will uh, show up around Yom Hatzimut, Yom Yerushalayim. Uh, but I think it'll still work well for uh, Dafka not being in Israel for those days, as crazy as that sounds. Um, so yeah, today we're starting um, Lily Man of Faith. Um, and Lily Man of Faith is part of, um, as I mentioned before, we'll see this again, throughout um, a turn in Osvaychik's thought from really emphasizing the man's ability to conquer things. It still is an important um aspect to focusing on man's um, ability to experience surrender and to experience transcendence to something outside himself, outside his power. Um, I think we'll see this uh, more next week, but that's actually one of the, the flaws that happens in how the Lily Man of Faith is often taught. It's on how I was first taught it. So people put the emphasis on, oh, look, Rosalvechik says um, that like being part of the modern world is is kosher is good that's what is an important part of the book is adam one we'll see next week is is uh, about being involved in the world that's the emphasis the emphasis is really on adam two on religion and on the ability to be vulnerable and weak and surrender like experience failure and the importance of all of those things is something that religion can teach the secular world um we're going to see this week, uh, that that's really uh, what Rolajic is, is responding to, is a sense that we as modern people live in a world that values a really specific kind of life, a specific kind of person, um, and that being religious is really about challenging that and being countercultural in some way. Um, so with that, um, I've sent you guys a source sheet along with the recording. Um, let's start with uh, source number one. It's just a good intro to the book. Uh, Rosalvich says, The nature of the dilemma can be stated in a, th a three-word sentence. I am lonely. Let me emphasize, however, that by stating I am lonely, I do not intend to convey to you the impression that I am alone. Thank God. I, I thank God you do enjoy the love and friendship of many. I meet people, talk, preach, argue, reason. I am surrounded by comrades and acquaintances. And yet, companionship and friendship do not alleviate the passional experience of loneliness which trails me constantly and passional. There's a word he likes that means emotional, I mean strong emotions. Um, 
But what Rosalvechik is emphasizing here is that loneliness is different from being alone, that um, loneliness is not about having people around. It's about a sense of uniqueness and just difference for between yourself and other people that makes you feel like other people could never really quite understand you. That no matter how many people you surround with and how much time you spend talking and conversing, there's always some part of you that um, you can't ever really explain that remains fundamentally almost strange to other people or would be strange if you could even really tell them about it. And the fact that you can't really convey yourself to other people is what um, Rosalvechik means by lonely. Uh, the second part of the source is uh, a subjective exploration. Because there's some part of yourself that you can never really explain to other people, the structure of this discussion, the nature of his whole discussion, has to be fundamentally subjective. Uh, when I look at the texts on that, he mentions this in his first chapter. He says, uh, air source number two, it is not the point of this essay to discuss the millennium-old problem of faith and reason. Theory is not my concern at the moment. I want instead to focus attention on a human life situation in which the man of faith as an individual concrete being, with his cares and hopes, concerns and needs, joys and sad moments, is entangled. Therefore, whatever I'm going to say here has been derived not from philosophical dialectics, abstract speculation, or detached impersonal reflections, but from actual situations and experiences with which I have been confronted. Indeed, the term lecture also is, in this context, a misnomer. It is rather a uh, tale of a personal dilemma. Instead of talking theology in the didactic sense, or the educational sense, eloquently and in balanced sentences, I would like hesitatingly and haltingly to confide in you, to share with you some of the concerns which weigh heavily on my mind and which frequently assume the proportions of an awareness of crisis. Lily Man of Faith is started as lectures, given um, twice, actually, once to a group of Christians, and once to, or, or either Christians or a mixed group that included Christians, which is why it's a deeply biblical book, but in some ways, at least lots of it are less rabbinic. Some parts are very, very rabbinic, um, but it speaks from a very biblical place. Um, we'll see you next week. Um, but um, it also, the second group of lectures was to um, just rabbinical students at YU. Um, but it, so this lecture um, that became this essay was really just saying is more his musings or speculations. And he starts um, Worship of the Heart, the book on Tzvila, the same way, that on some level it's not an attempt to describe an abstract truth, it's an attempt to describe the subjective experience of faith and what it means to be a faithful individual. Source number three, before beginning the analysis, um, we must determine with in which frame of reference, psychological and empirical, or theological and biblical, our dilemma should be described. I believe you will agree with me that we do not have much choice in the matter, for to the man of faith, self-knowledge is only one connotation. To understand one, one's place and role within the scheme of events and things willed and approved by God, when he ordered finitude to emerge out of infinity and the universe, including man, to unfold itself. This kind of self-knowledge may not always be pleasant or comforting. On the contrary, it might, from time to time, express itself in a painful appraisal of the difficulties which the man of faith caught in his paradoxical destiny has to encounter. For knowledge at both points, scientific and the personal, is not always a eudaimonic experience, and eudaimonic meaning good, pleasant, happy, um, however, this unpleasant prospect should not deter us from our undertaking. So the uh, start of this is that the point of the book is not to arrive at abstract truth um, or sort of theology, but the understanding of what it means to be a person of faith, a person before God. And this kind of self-knowledge might not be comfortable. It's not always easy to think about what it means, to think about um, the importance of um some degree of sacrifice or failure, surrender, um, as well as the importance of you know success. Um, but it's important, even if uh, it's not always pleasant. Before I go any further, I want to make the following reservation. What I am about to say is to be seen only as a modest attempt on the part of a man of faith 
to interpret his spiritual perceptions and emotions in modern theological and philosophical categories. My interpretive gesture is completely subjective and lays no claim to representing a definitive philosophy. If my audience will feel these interpretations are also relevant to their perceptions and emotions, I shall feel amply rewarded. However, I shall not feel hurt in my thoughts and uh, will find no response in the hearts of my listeners. As we said, he's emphasizing that there's a fundamentally subjective aspect to this, which means that it may honestly not speak to other people. Um, but on some level, when it comes to self-understanding of what it means to be a person, you can only really express your subjective opinions. You can, uh, we'll see in, in two weeks' time, try and translate it as well as possible into a language that everyone will understand. But on some level, you're, you're never really going to be entirely successful in that. Um, and the other thing I want to note here is this line, my interpretive gesture is completely subjective and lays no claim to representing a definitive philosophy. Um, it's been quite a while at this point, but one of our first classes, our fourth class, I think we um, did the halachic mind, which ends with the line um, that out of the sources of uh, halacha, a new philosophy of Judaism waits to be discovered. That they, they from this, the Russell Hage's goal at in the 40s when he wrote those books was his his vision of an ideal was to create a philosophy out of the sources of halacha. And here he's really stepped away from that and said, no, we're not going to try and create this really objectively true model of Judaism um, based on halacha. Is on some level, uh, what we're doing here is just trying to explain what it feels like and what it means as an individual to live before God. Um, source number seven is um, we're going to set up in some sense for next week to talk about the broader context of this book, which is that. Um, on some level, Russell Hitchcock is rejecting biblical criticism, um, and you're going to see here um, why. In source, number, um, source number four, he says, it will be worthwhile to add the following in order to place the dilemma in the proper focus. I would never, have, I have never been seriously troubled by the problem of biblical doctrine of creation, vis-a-vis -vis the scientific story of evolution at both the cosmic and the organic levels. Nor have I been perturbed by the confrontation of the mechanistic interpretation of the human mind with the biblical spiritual concept of man. So just in terms of the level of um, like science versus Torah, he's never been bothered by those contradictions on any level. I have not been perplexed by the impossibility of fitting the mystery revelation into the framework of historical empiricism. Um, he's... Torah, on some hand, on some level, represents revelation as a mysterious thing, and so he's never even felt the need to put that together with history, science. Moreover, I have not even been troubled by the theories of biblical criticism, which contradict the very foundations upon which the sanctity and integrity of scriptures um, rest. However, while theoretical oppositions and dichotomies never tormented my thoughts, I could not shake off the disquieting feeling that the practical role of the man of faith within modern society is a very difficult, indeed, a paradoxical one. All of these debates that will criticism within the text or between the text and history or science, they might be important debates on some level, there, but for Rosalovicic, they're fundamentally theoretical and then don't actually get down to what it really means to be a person of faith. Um, and what he's going to focus on, and this is essentially what we're going to move into talking about next, is the practical role of the man of faith within modern society, with a role that he says is difficult and indeed paradoxical, meaning there's something actually contradictory between being a man of faith and being a person in modern society. Um, and that's really important because what that's going to get down to is the definitions of faith and the definitions of modern, um, which are not strictly the way we typically think of them. It's not like science and history on one side uh, and, you know, Revelation, Torah, Halach on the other side. And we're talking about Adam 1, Adam 2 next week. Um, and we'll see that uh, society is very deeply modeled on Adam 1, which is a certain posture of majesty or dignity or glory. And on the other side, what faith is about is about a certain receptivity and vulnerability and redemption. Uh, for now, I want to talk about what kind of loneliness is the loneliness of the lonely man of faith. Um, source number five. I must address myself to the obvious question. 
Why am I beset by this feeling of loneliness and being unwanted? Is it the Kierkegaardian anguish and ontological fear nurtured by the awareness of non-being threatening one's existence that assails me? Or is this feeling of loneliness due to my own personal stresses, cares, and frustrations? Or is it perhaps the result of the pervasive state of mind of Western man who has become estranged from himself, a state with which all of us as Westerners are acquainted? I believe that even though all three explanations might be true to some extent, the genuine and central cause of the feeling of loneliness from which I cannot free myself will be found in a different dimension, namely in the experience of faith itself. Um, so here he's actually listed, he lists in this passage four different types of um, of loneliness, of being unwanted. One is this ontological fear that on some level um, we feel that we are individuals who could disappear at any moment. Our, the threat of death makes us feel alone. Uh, the second is just you know personal stresses, cares, and frustrations. Your own emotions are something that other people don't share with you. And therefore, you feel lonely and hard to explain your frustrations just to people. Um, third, and this is actually going to be more important than he suggests here, is the uh, result of the pervasive state of mind of Western man who's become estranged from himself. That Western man is not aware of who he is, not in touch with himself. Not in the sense that you hear about in like Rivera's class or other places about trying to get into your authentic self so much as um, man never stops to just exist and accept himself as he is. Uh, man is constantly obsessed with achieving more and, and acquiring more and doing more. And um, on some level, that's Adam one, but it's Adam one, as we'll see in a second, in, uh, or we'll see in a few sources, in a um, drastically... Uh, twisted form. And the, the last form of loneliness, the one that's most important, is the experience of faith itself. The experience of faith is itself some form of loneliness. Um, there's a sense of individual, of being an individual with, that you can't really explain yourself to other people is critical to, in fact, is what makes up the experience of faith. Uh, faith, as we're going to see, um, next week is about being in relationship with God, um, but that's something you always do as an individual, um, and as, you know, as a subjective experience, and that's not all you cannot explain to other people. Source number six is going to begin to explain the uh, the tension between faith and Western society. On the one hand, the man of faith has been a solitary figure throughout the ages, indeed millennia. And no one has succeeded in escaping this unalterable destiny, which is an objective awareness rather than a subjective feeling. On the other hand, it is undeniably true that this basic awareness expresses itself in a variety of ways, utilizing the whole gamut of one's effective emotional life. The gamut just means a range, uh, which is extremely responsive to outward challenges and moves along with a tide of cultural and historical change. So he starts by saying, on the one hand, this loneliness is inherent to what it means to be a man of faith. And a man of faith has always been someone who's lonely and solitary. On the other hand, the nature of this loneliness changes throughout history and society. Uh, therefore, it is my intent to analyze this experience at both levels, the ontological, which is a root awareness. The, this is the nature of what it means to exist as a human, that you're um, lonely, and at the historical, at which is highly sensitized and agitated heart overwhelmed by the impact of social and cultural forces, filters this root awareness through the medium of painful, frustrating emotions. Um, the, uh, who we are as humans in general gets filtered through the lens of who we are in our specific moment in history, this time and place where we live, where our societies shape us in a certain way, and we experience even greater loneliness than we might have otherwise. As a matter of fact, the investigation at the second level is my prime concern, since I am mainly interested in contemporary man of faith, who is, due to his peculiar position in our secular society, lonely in a special way. No matter how time-honored and time-hallowed the interpenetration of faith and loneliness is, and certainly goes back to the dawn of the Judaic covenant, contemporary man of faith lives through a particularly difficult and agonizing crisis. And so the... Um, essay will on some will focus on modern day, which 
uh, was, he meant the 60s, but it's certainly true um, today as well. And he's focusing on what it means to be the man of faith in the modern American society, uh, where the tension between uh, willingness to be uh, open and vulnerable versus trying to be uh, successful and um, well-respected and dignified um, is greater than it may ever have been before. Let me spell out this passional experience of contemporary man of faith. He looks upon himself as a stranger in modern society, which is technically minded, self-centered and self-loving, almost in a sickly narcissistic fashion, scoring honor upon honor, piling up victory upon victory, reaching for the distant galaxies, seeing in the here and now sensible world the only manifestation of being. What can a man of faith like myself, living by a doctrine which has no technical potential, by a law which cannot be tested in the laboratory, uh, steadfast in his loyalty to an eschatological vision whose fulfillment cannot be predicted with any degree of probability, let alone certainty, even by the most complex advanced mathematical calculations? What can such a man say to a functional utilitarian society which is seculum oriented and whose practical reasons of the mind have long ago supplanted sensitive reasons of the heart? Um, he's here a lot of different distinctions between faith on one hand and modern society on the other. Um, but I want to mention that there's a uh, New York Times columnist named David Brooks, and he, I think he's where I first saw this. Um, regardless of what I think he was writing in general, he, I believe I first saw him mentioning that um, Adam One um, modern society could be thought of as uh, what as being a category of virtues that you might call resume virtues, whereas Adam two and faith can be thought of as uh, epitaph virtues, that uh, things that modern society values are things that look good on your resume. Uh, your honor upon honor, victory upon victory, um, functional, utilitarian, um, success, um, the ability to predict things, to uh, good things that could be tested in the laboratory, things that have technical potential, that are useful skills, versus the man of faith is the person who believes something that can't be proven, um, who is sensitive um, and uses their heart instead of the practical reason of the mind, someone who's not interested in honor upon honor, someone who's not so self-centered or self-loving. Um, that's the fundamental distinction, that to be a man of faith is to be uh, not interested not in success or uh, in yourself or in your practical ability to you know manipulate things or to build society. Um, though once again, he is going to say I don't want to make this too strong a distinction because Adam One does have um, a role to play in what it means to be a man of faith. To be a man of faith is to have be both Adam One and Adam Two. But the emphasis has to be on, we're going to see on Adam 2, um, without which, um, as we'll see in the next paragraph, Adam 1 can become much worse than, than just a bad kind of human. Um, so, number seven, the situation has deteriorated considerably in this century, which has witnessed the greatest triumphs of majestic man in his drive for conquest. Majestic Adam has developed, this is from near the end of the book, but majestic Adam has developed a demonic quality, laying claim to unlimited power, alas, to infinity itself. His pride is almost boundless, his imagination arrogant, and he aspires to complete an absolute control of everything. Indeed, like the men of old, he is engaged in constructing a tower whose apex should pierce heaven, referencing Migdal Pavel. He is intoxicated with his own adventures and victories and is bidding for unrestricted dominion. From a religious point of view, as I said before, they are quite legitimate and in compliance with the divine testament given to Adam the first that he should rule nature. When I say that modern man is projecting a demonic image, I am thinking of man's attempt to dominate himself, or, to be more precise, of Adam the first desire to identify himself with the total human personality. So in theory, you know, success and power all have a place within human nature. But if you, when you make that all of what it means to be human, you forget the important critical role of vulnerability, sensitivity, receptivity, being open to other people, being open to God, um, then you've you shifted from just being human into being demonic, to being part of the forces of evil 
that tear apart our reality and tear apart our existence. And that's really where modern man has ended up for uh, Rosa Levesic. And on some level, that's, you know, about Rosa Levesic being someone who lived through the great wars of the 20th century. But even more than that, it's about someone who, you know, lived into the the end of the 20th century, just about where America went from, uh, however you want to describe it, the beginning of the 20th century, to a full-on consumerist society um, based upon, you know, just... Uh, making more money and buying more things and having a better career and all of those things that we sort of grow up uh, knowing are important. And the goal of Holy Man of Faith is in some sense to push back against that and say there are other things that are important too. Um, a Halachic Man, actually to shift gears to say Halachic Man, was a book where Soviet really wrote in some ways for his family to explain why he was leaving, um, you know, the shtetl and going to go learn in Berlin, um, why he had why he had gone from being um, more traditionally, uh, say, orthodox to being modern orthodox, from going from the sort of almost closed up Haredi world that he lived in to, uh, you know, <laughs> Germany and then New York and Berlin. Um, that on some level, Man is about explaining that the modern world is actually not that different from the Shiva world, because both of them deeply value intellect and um, personal achievement through intellect and things like that. Um, and um, um, so it's about explaining to you know tradition and Judaism that um, there's actually a great value in modernity. And only my faith is sort of doing the opposite, trying to explain to people who are deeply modern that there is value and importance to religion, um, to faith. So obviously, I think um, this is an important message for everyone all the time. I think it's pushes so importantly against some um, against some of our most dangerous intuitions about just trying not not even to like consciously take from other people but we sort of so inherently are interested in self-assertion in ways that can be important dignity is important and we'll see that next week but it can be so dangerous uh, and so there's something really important in general about lonely man of faith um it's one is why it's one of my favorite of um Russell of H's works um but also i guess particularly at this moment when you've all found yourselves back in, um, you know, your home communities, uh, which if you're lucky, don't have this problem. And I think actually right now we're seeing that lots of religious communities and even secular communities are really recognizing um, the importance of communities based on frailty, weakness, because as scary as it can be, the one of the things that's happening right now is that we're all collectively recognizing our weakness and that that weakness thing that makes us deeply commonly human that vulnerability to illness is one of those things that can be and should be deeply uniting um it's one of the, that's so upsetting of people who've disregarded uh rules about trying to manage the spread of illness the feeling that they themselves will be immune um, beyond the fact that there's a deep hubris in that, because we have not yet found a single age group that's, uh, you know, immune. And you never know what person, people, most people don't necessarily know if they have underlying um, conditions that might they might not be aware of yet that might make them very vulnerable. Um, but it's something also uh, it's a, to put yourself in risk for that uh, of infection particularly knowing that you could then spread it to someone else, uh, is again the sort of deeply demonic self-assertion of you think you're powerful um, in a way that separates yourself from the rest of humanity. Um, but so thankfully, most people have not reacted. Most people have uh, reacted in a way that is insensitive to the real humanness that's involved in uh, vulnerability and the vulnerability of being truly human. And um, 
So as much as I'm saying that this is ever a countercultural, uh, that the Holy Man of Faith is so much a countercultural book for our day and age in America, and that's generally true. Hopefully, right now, um, it's something that will resonate much more with what our communities are experiencing and how people in our communities are reacting. Um, yeah, so that's the first class on Holy Man of Faith. Um, thank you to uh, let's say all of you who listened, optimistically speaking. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to message me in the group personally. Also, just to let me know how you're doing. Um, I look forward to hearing from you.